Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very pleased here to, first of all, welcome you to the DCRI Research Conference, um, and even more pleased to welcome Peter Wilson, uh, who is our speaker today. He's the Director of Epidemiology and Genomic Medicine um, at, at uh, uh, Emory and a professor uh, in cardiology and public health there. He uh, earned his undergraduate degree at Yale and uh, MD from University of Texas in San Antonio, and then um, did all of his house staff training, residency, and fellowship here at Duke in endocrinology, so he is a Dukey. And from there became director of the laboratories for the Framingham Heart Study and on the faculty at BU for 20 years. Uh, moved from there to become head of the GCRC and uh, vice chair of medicine for research at uh, MUSC before moving to Emory. He's published over 500 peer-reviewed papers and is the current president of the American Society of Preventive Cardiology, which is pretty good considering he's an endocrinologist. Um, Dr. Wilson's topic today is cardiovascular risk prediction, and um, uh, as you all know, there'll be questions at the end. Peter, welcome. No, it's turning the volume up, okay. So thanks very much. The, uh, the title of this talk, I was telling Jerry uh, earlier, and when we started out doing this in, in Framingham in the 1980s, uh, nobody thought you could predict who was gonna get a heart attack. And by now, everybody just sort of says, yeah, we can do it, it's a question of how well we do it, so. Um, what I'm going to go through is to give you a flavor large. This is title is cardiovascular disease. I'm going to focus mostly on coronary heart disease, especially on first events. And they're going to, and we're going to spend most of the time with ideas and concepts and not lots of trivia. I'm going to give you the feeling for where the field has been and really where it's going. Uh, is every opportunity is uh, out there right now to develop newer models, newer approaches to risk estimation. Uh, coronary disease started out with something fairly simple uh, with prospective studies and without interventions. And here you are, at a, especially a leadership uh, around the world for trials, and trials build on these observational studies. So uh, most of the modeling and most of the concepts are formulated on things that can be intervened on, though. Uh, there are some problems, of course, with all these types of model development, so let me make sure I do all this right. Disclosures, I can, I can do all, stand here, is it okay if I stand here? Because I can't see the slide behind me. I can see it down here, though. Yeah, well, you have more slides and views everywhere, so anyway, sorry. Because it's down there. But he's going to be able to bring it up over there. Okay. That one's not working. That's all right. I'm all right. Okay. Whoops. Go back. I go back is left. Oh, I have to use this. I just want to go back. Do I have to use the pointer to do that, or I can just go back? Because you can't see that. So the black ones. Yeah. Okay. okay, I apologize. No, I That's, That's all right. So Just the silver ones. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's stay out of trouble. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So we're going to talk about the methods, how we use the evidence. I'm going to have something in this talk on MI risk equivalents. So I'm on the next panel risk assessment for a national cholesterol education program. I can't say what's on that list of risk equivalents, but I'm going to give you the sort of discussion that's going into that. That's not been decided. And then the challenges uh, and summary and recommendations where we are really at this point. So this is an example. Um, this is a short list. Don Lloyd-Jones wrote a paper in CERC about the last two or three months. Uh, with a longer spreadsheet of this, but this is a, a simple one. For instance, you look along, you can see risk factors over on the left, over here, 
on the far left column. And you, you, almost everybody has age. They have sex. They want to have separate models for approaches for men and for women. Remember, women don't tend to get heart disease before menopause, unless they're diabetic or, or historically a smoker uh, and maybe estrogen use. Uh, but uh, so we, when in doubt, we try to use separate approaches for men and for women. Um, the, the lipid measures, as you can see there, there's cholesterol, HDL, and LDL. Um, I'm a clinician, and I use LDL and HDL to take care of patients. Don't do as much with total cholesterol. But total cholesterol is a good beginning approach uh, because it's a rock-solid measure. People measure cholesterol very well. They don't measure LDL quite as well. Um, systolic pressure has always been preferred over diastolic pressure. Uh, it's something that we, in population science, we emphasize with all the trainees. The average cardiology fellow doesn't know that when we work with them. Uh, internists don't generally know that systolic pressure is more highly associated with outcomes. The um, other variables, cigarette smoking has almost always been cigarettes and not other smoking, but you probably should include the other. Uh, diabetes has moved in and out of risk estimation because of American policy. Uh, whether it's a risk equivalent, and that's been highly debated in the last five to eight years. ECG LVH, that's an example. Is that a risk equivalent? In most people's books, yes. Why, isn't, why don't we talk about ECG LVH to figure out if you go talk to your doctor tomorrow, they're not going to do a cardiogram and figure out whether you have left ventricular hypertrophy. It's because the prevalence has become so low. Only one or two percent of whites. Now, the Association of Black Cardiologists is not happy with that at all because the 1991 version of this had ECG-LVH. And it's a very potent risk factor in African Americans, especially in the South, as you all know. Um, and then there are others that can be uh, added at any time, as you might guess. The, more of these are the same than they are different. Uh, they, there's some more recent ones. And the next version is probably going to be an amalgam of the United States uh, uh, Framingham, Eric, other uh, studies. So how do we do this? And one of them is to bring in biomarkers. Most of the variables are, that we're dealing with are pretty well set. So the biomarker is the critical thing for what might improve the field and or imaging or some sort of non-invasive. So we have cross-sectional studies. That's the originally way you start. And then you move to the next major bullet is incident studies. Nobody really wants to talk about prediction without incidents. Otherwise, you just have a yes, no, and that's a, a cross-sectional approach. That's not good enough. And then we have what are these newer terms, and these are called performance measures. It's discrimination, classification, uh, the ability to separate who's going to be an event and who's not. The other thing is you can develop something. Let's say you've done this here at Duke. You published uh, uh, prediction models in the last two weeks, three weeks from in CERC or CERC outcomes uh, using CRP, for instance, and other variables. But does it work elsewhere? Is it going to be useful, for instance, with a Duke equation or the Duke uh, database experience in the observational database here? Where would you apply it? Might be, ex in fact, it may be the very best thing for North Carolina as opposed to a national model. So that's one of the things that comes up is once you develop something, can you generalize? And then if you have biomarkers, this always keeps coming back. Is, is, does it vary from person to person? How good is the lab? Uh, and what does it cost? Virtually every biomarker uh, starts out expensive, and as you do more and more of them, it gets cheap. Uh, anybody in a lab can tell you that. Uh, almost the most expensive laboratory marker can get very cheap within five or ten years with a lot of measurements. So these are the types of things. You know, everybody takes for granted their specimens are collected perfectly. You know, we're um, working with a collaboration, planning with uh, Pam and Jerry and others. And uh, this is a, often a stumbling block for studies. For instance, if you uh, leave specimens out on a bench, uh, certain things go sour very fast certain markers that can get oxidized. And if you have one sort of collection center that leaves them out on the bench and everybody else follows a protocol, puts things in ice buckets right away, 
you can start to see differences. Uh, uh, or if they get shipped to the lab and you've got, uh, they're going to do procedure one and then procedure two and one person's lazy and doesn't leaves it out on the bench, uh, you can get lousy data. And sometimes it takes a while to sort out why you're getting uh, problems. And it can be as simple as not the machine, but the human person taking care of the specimens. And so. So variability can also be an issue. For instance, uh, one of the famous ones we often ask a, uh, a fellow is somebody, Mr. Mr. Jones is here in lipid clinic. Uh, they didn't measure his lipids. He's got the flu. He really feels terrible. Should I send him to get the labs? And I said, well, that's probably a waste of time. You know, if he's got the flu, he's barely here. He's sick. He's got all these antioxidants going. He's got acute phase reactants. His CRPs off the roof. His fibrinogen's way up. All, why would you measure his lipids today? It's really not a very helpful lipid measure. So it's the issue of human variability, uh, and that that's especially can be an issue at times. You take for granted that your lab is, is standardized. Probably not. You know, most hospital labs are not standardized. They're not the same as a research lab. A cholesterol at all of your different sites here is different. We have five hospitals in ours, and I, my colleague, uh, Javed Butler, is doing a uh, BNP study, he's got problems because uh, each one's measuring them unless he, he does a, uh, a his own internal standardization. Gradient and effects. If you have a new factor, you think it's linear, but often they're not. I guess a good example would be Paul Ridker's CRP data. His initial findings were all on quartile analyses. And that's more and more what you're seeing with new biomarkers. Uh, so. Uh, I think it's important to go after things that have some clinical rele relevance. Uh, this is a new concept down here, skipping down to ApoB, for instance, versus LDL. Newer markers may replace older markers. Slightly different strategy for that. Uh, and uh, not every investigator is used to thinking of that. Uh, you just say, well, let's just throw everything into the model and we'll go get a good statistician. And the statistician will spend a fair amount of time talking with the investigator and say, what is your question? Are you trying to show inferiority, superiority, replacement? So how you do it does make a difference. Uh, some people, for instance, let's say you had a study with 30 cases and uh, out of uh, 200 people and you had 30 variables in your model. And um, 30 variables in your model. Well, that's called oversaturation of a model. It'd be the same thing as having everybody's first name. You know, I can identify the people real well who are going to have it be a case because I know their name. You know, there are 30 variables. So you get used to using five to ten variables in hundreds of cases as the most common approach. So. I'm just, I'm not going to go through all these, but these are the terms. Discrimination, calibration, and reclassification are the sort of the building blocks now for risk estimation and prediction. Uh, and discrimination, I'm going to give you examples. It's area under curves and whether one curve is different from another. Calibration means if it works for me, does it work somewhere else? Or do I need to calibrate it? Are there intercept differences? And reclassification is, does that mean uh, I could do a, potentially a test on a portion of the population and not on everybody? And so it's a, a, a newer strategy for using effective new, new testing, whatever types of testing, imaging or biomarker testing. So how do you do this? One of the questions that comes up uh, clinicians ask sometimes is, how do you do this? And there's something of a catch-22 because different investigators do it different ways. Uh, you start out, let's say you've got a new factor. Let's say it's CRP. Think back five or ten years ago, what Dr. Ridker was trying to do and others like him. So he'd, he'd test for CRP and whether it's associated with an outcome. And then he'd do it separately with men and women and he'd age and sex adjust. And then he'd take regular factors, traditional factors, and then he'd add his new biomarker, like C-reactive protein. And then he would see whether it was a significant. And that's the typical approach. Uh, and then when I had said this, slightly different if you're replacing. So this is an example of how you use discrimination. If you flipped a coin and you were trying to estimate whether a person's going to get uh, an outcome, you'd have an area under the curve, which is this diagonal line. That's a 50%. It's not a curve. It's a line. 
because it's a 50% area under the curve. Or it, you can think of an AUC or an area under the curve also like a C statistic, which are a, another way to summarize. The C statistic, the, which is this area underneath these curves, can have an error around it. You could have a little gray band, a plus or minus. And for, so if you had a big study and you had a, a good a way to estimate with your methods, uh, you'd have a very narrow band around that line. So it's usually it's a few percentage points. It might, might, might be, for instance, this area might be something around 0.7. This would be 0.9. Most heart disease prediction is in the range of around 0.7 to 0.8. And in fact, we predict Generally, we predict events better in women than we do in men, uh, interestingly enough. So, so here's an example of data. This is from a 1998 paper I wrote. And this was comparison, comparing um, just finger counting, regular risk factors a la ATP2, which was the algorithm at the time, versus continuous measures versus categories. And we found that the continuous and the categories tied. In other words, you didn't really need to know a cholesterol was 202. It was a good enough to know that cholesterol was in a 200 to 240 band. And the same way you didn't need to know your, H, your systolic pressure was 112. It was good to know it was just 110 to 120. So using categories. And this allows it a lot easier communication to patients, and it starts to create tools that physicians can use. If you don't have that, if you have a continuous measure approach, you have to have a pocket calculator, or a computer, or a spreadsheet, or an electronic medical record. And EMR doesn't care. In fact, it would rather have the, the continuous measures. But if you're trying to communicate to patients, they say, well, all right, well, I'm in this band of cholesterol, for instance, I want to move down. Or for an LDL, I want to move into a, a, a healthier band. And, but that would, and that might improve points. And so people can start to get an explanation, understanding for improving their score, so to speak. But as you can see here, this is pretty good. Uh, this is considerably less. Uh, this is about 0.65 with the yellow, and it's about 0.7, 0.75. Uh, with the categorical or continuous. And then this is what you transmit to a patient. And I put that up. It's very simple, uh, and it's been used in a variety of ways. For instance, the, what is it? At websites, uh, if you go to the national guidelines, you can get things like this. For instance, a patient with these numbers, this is a 55-year-old man, and this is Framingham, but it's been tested for a lot of white groups around the United States. What does that number mean? What does 16 mean? That means that he has a 16% chance of developing a new coronary event over 10 years. So that's, what, that's one interpretation. And if you divide that by 10, you, you, you get 1.6% per year. And we, that would be intermediate risk a la current American guidelines. 10% to 20% is our intermediate risk. That's another thing that who knows whether that'll change, but that's what we've been using for about the last decade. Another way to interpret that is that if you had 100 people like him, there would be 16 of them who would get an event in the next 10 years. Two different, slightly different ter interpretations, okay? What you don't have is the error around his estimate, right? You, so you say it's 16, but is it plus or minus 2, plus or minus 10. You don't know how good that is. There are other ways to do that, but typically this is the type of information that is, we give to patients. And then what do you compare them to? When we wrote the paper in 98, we originally were going to use this group as the comparison. This paper took a life of its own with review. And this ended up becoming the comparison group. And this has pretty much been the comparison group since that point is lowest risk. Uh, the British, if you were at a meeting and you had some British colleagues here speaking, they would say, we would pick this group. So these, the comparators start to become expert committee driven and um, out of the hands of investigators. And, and they'll change over time, depending upon how well we can treat and how successfully uh, we are. I skipped that. So here's an example. Um, 
of predicting and taking a Framingham risk equation and trying to predict in Hawaii. The relative risks are pretty good for blood pressure. These bars are similar. This is for middle-aged men. Uh, the diabetes, a bigger impact in Hawaii. They have a lot of metabolic syndrome, and that's, that's more the way they get heart disease uh, out there. The survival curve experiences are different. So you have, uh, after 10 years, you have 90% versus 94%. So that's an incidence rate of 6% versus 10%. So it's almost twice the risk in Framingham. So should you use a Framingham equation in Hawaii? Relative risk is the same, but survival is different. Think about it. I'm going to show you the next slide. It's going to give you the answer. Are you going to underestimate or overestimate risk? So. All right, so Framingham overestimates risk pretty strongly. So who would be interested in that? Maybe somebody who is selling medications to treat risk, right? All right? Because then you would be treating a bunch of people. They would be down here, but you thought they were there, so you're, you're going to be treating them. And that's one of the public health uses of risk estimates, is that you can then take the whole population and you figure out where should we target identifying people. Should we start here? Should we start there? If you take your entire population, you can model it out, and you can then make informed decisions of where you want to do that. So. Um, same sort of thing. Now, this is with adjustments, and I, it says in the parentheses underneath. So if you take the Framingham survival and you take the average levels in Hawaii and you calibrate it, this is what's calibrating, you can, in fact, use Framingham and Hawaii and without their having to go out and create their own equations. But then you would say, maybe they want to use their own equations. Yeah. That, that may be fine. In fact, the best data would be for them to use their own approach, uh, but they could calibrate uh, with other American equations. So you could have another point would be such, a, and it might be Japanese-American male, and it would give you favorable points to, that would affect your risk. Now, this is what happened when we col collaborated with, we were approached by scientists from Beijing, and they said, we have a large study. We're concerned that we're going to overestimate risk using Framingham equations. And you bet you, look at that. So without calibration on the left, tremendous. And the top x, uh, y axis is up to 0.2. Now this is calibrated, so this is all brought down into this range. And the calibration's not perfect, but it's not bad. So now the, ja the, the Chinese did this with 30,000 people, and that was their bridge. It gave them comfort and, and how they're put, and now they have their own equation. They have their own algorithm. And they don't use uh, a calibrated uh, Framingham number at all. They have their own. And, and they've developed their own, and now they're starting to calibrate their own across different parts of China. Uh, China's got high-risk groups and low-risk groups, uh, similar to what we have in the States. So it's, and it helps them for planning. So. so one of the questions come up, are these people really different? Uh, this is, I just put an example. Um, they're not that different. You know, this is a, you, know, you just scan down. Everybody says, oh, they really got great cholesterol. No, look at this. You know, average cholesterol. They didn't have HDL, unfortunately. Men smoke, women don't. They're, they have differences, but the numbers are not, the traditional numbers are not explaining things. So they haven't gone and, and done all some of the newer, even the CRP types of questions that, we've largely been doing. And do they predict pretty well? That C statistic measure, they do about as well as, this is framing him on its own. They're, they do pretty well. They do very well. Really. Now, where do you go after that? And that's why I was prepping you with the biomarkers. So Aaron Folsom, who is one of the senior uh, population scientists with atherosclerosis risk and community study, uh, found collaborators who would measure a lot of things. And it's this list over here, the novel risk factors. So they measured about 20 things. And then they started out with a C statistic. And that's what this basic model is up here. And you see it's around 0.76. And they did a more than a, you can imagine number of analyses. But this is the analysis that's in the paper. They start out with 0.76. And they show the effect of adding what they thought they believe with their data was the most important next factor. 
and then successively considering others. All right? So they start out at 0.76 and they get up to 0.82 in their predictive model with that C statistic. And here's the increment, how much you get with each step up. The, and your, each one isn't doing much. Not much at all, right? 0 0.00 and then a little bit. All right. So this led to the concept of the C statistic to evaluate new risk factors perhaps isn't the best thing, the only thing to consider, and we need other ways to think about how to uh, assess these newer factors. And that's where, well, maybe that's because you're measuring this C st these new factors in everybody. He had thousands of people, so you're measuring it in everybody. Perhaps you shouldn't do that. And so other strategies to measure it, and perhaps the people for whom it might be most useful. Other papers come out. This is Tommy Wang's paper. This is both pri primary and secondary occurrence of events. This is Framingham. And it started to bring in some other variables. And so, for instance, BNP, homocysteine, renin, CRP, urinary albumin to creatinine ratio. And for cardio, that was for death. And for CVD, BNP and urinary albumin to creatinine ratio. Now, those are just the variables that happen to be in the Framingham database. The, one of the weaknesses of this paper is it was both primary and secondary events. Once you have had a coronary event, how much, uh, how much underlying myocardial disease or atherosclerotic disease you have is an issue. Your treatments are more of an issue. Most of these others have not had a lot of uh, information on treatments. Blood pressure treatment has generally worked its way into most models in the modern era. But cholesterol treatment is still not in any of these prediction models. So, so here's an example. This is um, Mike Schlippach's paper. This is an example. This is from CHS. This is an older group, everybody over age 65 at entry into this cardiovascular health study. And they had traditional factors, but then they also found another set of novel factors. There are certain ones that keep coming up uh, beyond CRP. Everybody knows about CRP. But one of them is the variables that feed into CRP. CRP is an integrating inflammatory marker that's produced in the liver. Most CRP is not from the atheromas. It's in the, it's in the liver. And the biggest stimulus, for instance, of higher CRP is interleukin-6. That's made in fat tissue. Uh, so you, you get into quickly into metabolomics and adipokines to start to sort out some of these as you test. But it's, uh, it's, it's an example. Oh, very good studies are typically finding both of these uh, markers coming in. So. Now, this is an example. I just put this up as a placeholder as I go into the next segment. This is what you're facing. This is metabolomics for lipids. These are all the different lipids. This is, um, this is even, you could, not one, any one method will do all of these. Uh, some of the newer lipid methods will break down these groups, the HDL groups, the VL, LDL, and a little bit of those. Most of them will miss these. These are remnants, intermediate density lipoproteins. Virtually nothing's picking up the nascent, uh, the very small hockey pucks size HDLs. So um, there, it's daunting to try to assemble the data because a new variable may end up being not just two or three things, but 20 things. And you run into issue of how do you assess uh, multiple testing. So it's a challenge uh, working with the statisticians as well. So here's an example of some of the newer ones that are coming out. Um, this was uh, a biomarker paper in the last couple of years. Uh, Zathelius's paper, traditional markers. So had troponin I, NT pro BNP, cystatin C. Cystatin C is is a marker that's definitely not going away anytime soon. It's, it's a kidney marker, uh, maybe slightly different information uh, versus regular creatinine. Uh, many studies have not had that. It's, uh, I always look for this. If they've got it, it's a fascinating new marker. Um, and then see reactive protein. And, they, and now many are, are starting to also do the net reclassification. So I'll give an example of that. Here's another one. This is the one that a paper that's gotten a lot of attention and come out in 2010. And you say, wow, look at that. First of all, big budget for lab uh, to measure all those. How do you do that? Well, you get into these micro quantities. 
And especially you, when you see this many markers, you think they've got tremendous support by a company that makes the machine. Uh, and they may have run them all gratis or incredibly reduced value uh, to, the, to the investigators be, for cost because they, it's just so expensive. Uh, and this was a, a study with a, uh, a validation cohort afterward. And they did all these different realms. And that's the next way we're thinking about this. See a vascular injury, lipids, kidney, metabolics. Uh, you get less of this than you might think. Other, for instance, factor seven, factor eight have come in and out, D-dimer, fibrinogen itself, uh, some of the others, and then cardiac markers as well. So, and this is hard, but I tell you, I didn't have a way to make a better slide of this. Uh, so, <laughs> it would have taken a lot of drawing. So, these are individual, the, the three major studies. So, there's a Finnish group, men and women, and then a Belfast group. And when you see a line that is different from the vertical line, the vertical line in this, these, these plots would suggest a null effect. So if you don't cross, that means you have either a favorable or an unfavorable effect. So the troponin I, you see for instance here, comes across, and in most of these studies, it was significant as a marker. So the, this is for CBD risk. And then they found similar things here. And then they also started to take one like down here. If you have CRP or N-terminal or troponin, so it's the idea of three biomarkers or two or th out of the three, you're starting to see these sort of cluster analyses. Maybe that's better. And that's something of what the Folsom paper considered when they had the 17. But how do you start to put that together? That's not been really well uh, organized up till now. Probably a principal components analysis is going to be the way of the future for that, but it's, it's in an early era for how to organize that sort of data. Diabetes, just as, a, as I'm going through, diabetics, uh, we use different approaches. The best thing running is probably Rory Holman's risk engine. There are many groups around the world who have had some concern about that. One is it's older data. Number two, it's based on a British trial, uh, largely driven with oral agents. And is it truly generalizable? Now, they're excellent investigators, and it's reasonably generalizable. But you start to get slightly different variables. For instance, hemoglobin A1C is a measure. And we all know what happens in clinical trials. Hemoglobin A1C, the lower and lower you get, is not necessarily more benefit. But in observation, in these earlier trials, lower was better. So how do you mix a slightly older algorithm with something that says lower and lower is not always necessarily better? Um, duration of diabetes. Now, they, they are investigating the albumin to creatinine ratio. It's not as strong in their data as you'd like to think. Uh, they also look at whether they have eye disease, other, other outcomes. Here's another one just starting. This is Nathan Wong's uh, recent data. He hasn't gotten this published yet. Uh, is coronary calcium. And Phil Greenland, uh, Nathan Wong, others have been investigating coronary calcium and especially starting to lead into, well, maybe you're not going to do coronary calcium on everybody. So perhaps this might be one of those reclassification variables. And I'm going to give you an example of that in a minute. So, All right. so we've got, this to summarize where we are, we're low risk, intermediate follow-up, typical 10 years. I, I didn't get into these. Um, most of the models we're talking about is like a simple visit, um, a, something that everybody could do pretty, pretty simply. Uh, the models that we were just seeing, like the Blankenberg paper, the Zithelius, are what I, in the Folsom are best complex. Those are researcher questions. What about this? What are these? Personal models is to develop something that the person would have the information, and then they figure out what's my risk. Do those work? I, I've done it, written a paper on Eric, data on that. It's, it's about like finger counting and framing him. It's not bad, uh, but it's not quite the level of science we would. But it, it's the sort of thing that can help be used for care to prompt people to go get uh, treatments or identification. And I'm going to give you an example of this lifetime as it's coming up. So. How do you also, how do you uh, assess a new factor? There's, this is Margaret Pepe's slide. I don't have her corner in the bottom, her name down there. But uh, 
Uh, it's the idea, you pretty well understand how the field of trials goes, but in fact, new tests, almost nobody does trials. Uh, so there, it's the idea of moving down and getting from self-report to measuring everything. The outcomes all get adjudicated eventually. The, as you develop models, uh, you have your own multi, for instance, the Chinese, this multi, the, for risk estimation, they have followed this all the way down, what I was talking about earlier. Uh, most groups have not done that. The Europeans have done this as well. Uh, and calibration uh, within, within China, for instance, they have not calibrated across China. Uh, within Europe, they're just starting to calibrate across Europe. In the United States, we've already calibrated across a lot of regions. Now, I'll just put this up for a second for the, more for clinicians, or see if you, you think these are CHD risk equivalents. This is, I sat down one day and wrote a list. Uh, this, these are some of the examples of what's been debated. Uh, for instance, diabetes typically doubles or triples risk, and it's been called a risk equivalent. Chronic kidney disease is it's maybe 10 times the risk. It's, it's really up there. So uh, it's a question of being aware of, the, of its different uh, risks. What about ECG abnormalities? Um, the evidence hasn't been assembled as much as it should. What about extremely high LDL cholesterol? Should somebody who has familial hypercholesterolemia be told that they have a CHD risk equivalent? Uh, similarly, what about super high blood pressure that we see, especially in the South? Uh, these are things that haven't really been brought into the guidelines, et cetera. Uh, this is a neat slide. I'm going to leave this up for a second. Um, most people who have been to diabetes meetings in the last six months have uh, seen this slide. And it was a meta-analysis, and it's a really neat meta-analysis. So it came out last year, and the Sentinel paper that said that diabetes is a risk equivalent is the Hafner paper, which is number three, which crosses the, uh, the, the one line, you know, it crosses the effect line. So it said that diabetes is a risk equivalent, and risk is much greater. So all these other studies have failed to confirm. Uh, they're all saying it's worse to have CHD than it is to have diabetes. And they've done a, a series of subgroup analyses. So this is an example of somebody puts out there a critical paper, gets into a guideline saying diabetes is a risk equivalent for risk prediction. And we now pull diabetes out of risk prediction in many of the guidelines, many of the papers. You, you can read a paper next week. Uh, the, the MESA paper that came out in the last two months, they did not include diabetics because they said diabetes is a risk equivalent. So let's just keep moving here. Now this is an example of reclassification. I'll go through quickly, you see here. These are all individuals. You might reclassify the person according to risk. And then you overlay the guidelines. So what does reclassification do? You would have a person's initial probability you would have after a new test, and then, for instance, this individual, you now evaluated whether CRP had an effect. Without CRP, his risk was 12. With CRP added in, his risk went down to 6%. Okay? If your reclassification guidelines were based, for instance, on 10% and 20%, you move that individual out of this central box. You reclassified him. So think of reclassifying as something new that puts the person into a new classification, and it made a difference. Like this person moved, but he didn't get out of the box. He still, so he didn't get reclassified. It, it affected risk. So it's, it's been developing as a new method. And then you can say, all right, I want to focus just on this group, or I want to focus on everybody, and I'm going to give you some examples. So this is from a paper I published a couple of years ago. And you take, if the new test, if you stay along the diagonal, it didn't have much of an effect. If you go up or you go down, and then you look separately whether you're a case or you're a non-case during the prospective follow-up. So there you see 6 and 0 and 8, 14% went up among the cases. 
and similar, it's just 6% went down. I'll go through these quickly. You can see over there, same sort of thing among the non-cases. And then the next table summarizes it. So you have 14% and a net here among the cases and a minus one. You had no, no, no favorable uh, yield. So an overall net reclassification with CRP in framing it. And that's very similar to what the Reynolds risk group found. It's pretty much in the 5 to 10% range. They found more when they added family history, uh, but 5 to 10% was CRP alone. Then here's an example. This is just done for um, coronary artery calcification. And I think this is going to be one of the most important papers out there. The Detrano paper reported the main results of MESA a couple of years ago for uh, asymptomatic uh, populations, different from the PROMISE trial, which are patients who are now reporting history as a symptoms. But the MESA, tri MESA study, observational study, not a trial, middle-aged adults, diabetics were excluded in the primary analysis, about six years of follow-up, and same sort of thing. I made this slide last night, so because you, you can't really figure it out the same way. So what did they do? They moved 34% of the cases up, and they moved 11% down. And the same thing for the non-cases. So overall, you, see, you can't do all of it quickly in your head unless you're a statistician. Is this going to be reclassify more than CRP, and how big is it going to be? And it reclassifies 25%. So I was so happy when I was doing all these numbers. I was saying last night, because I, I, I remembered, I said to Pam, I think it's 30%. And I go, it's 25%. Let me double check the manuscript. That was, yeah. And they found exact, these, so these are exactly the numbers that they had. Uh, and it takes a little bit of a, an effort, but that's, gonna, that's a significant reclassification. The issue is, if you go back, let's see if I do this right. Oh, can I do that? No. Well, anyway, you have a lot of people at low risk where you did the scan. <laughs> that's the point. Should you have really done the scan then? you probably would have focused more on the intermediate risk if you were to do it again. In the same way when Paul Ridker uh, tested for CRP in his first women's study, he had 26,000 women he measured CRP. And there were oh, 23,000 other women were in an extremely low risk and he didn't reclassify at all. And so he had 23,000 tests that you probably wouldn't measure nowadays because you wouldn't, that's not an effective use of a test. They're at low risk. It would take an incredible test to move them and reclassify them up, those groups. So. Now, a couple of other examples as I'm ending. This is another thing that has been used not so much for shorter studies or intermediate studies, but lifetime or 20 or 30 year studies. This is going to be working its way into our uh, guidelines. And here's an example with uh, to total cholesterol. These are Framingham data. There aren't too many studies that have it. Don Lloyd-Jones at Northwestern is pretty much amalgamating all the U.S. data with long-term follow-up. So let's concentrate on a, somebody you might see in clinic. You may see a 40-year-old man, and you'd say overall his lifetime risk is around 45 or 50 percent of developing heart disease. But if he had a low versus a high cholesterol, it ranges from 31 to 57. You get that? And on the other hand, for instance, you come across here, an old, let's say a 70-year-old woman, she's not, ever, she's not had heart disease up till now. What's her risk for the rest of her life? So Framingham has followed these people, you know, up until death. So she still has ranging from 14 to 29 percent. Even at all the same ages, the women's risks are lower. Overall, the women's risk is around a third, and men's risk is closer to a half uh, for the outcome. The same sort of thing. This can get exploded, but then you start to uh, challenge your ability to handle dimensions. And, uh, and this is an example of Caroline Fox, and I wrote a paper for looking at diabetes and obesity. And if you're an obese, I'll take an obese man or an obese woman. All right. So well, here, here's a BMI of 30 plus. You have diabetes. You're in this bar here, okay, these vertical bars. So your lifetime risk of developing this outcome, this is total CVD, is 79% during your course of your lifetime. So it's, it gets incredibly high. Virtually all of them are going to get vascular disease. Mm -hmm. 
And I'll, I'll end on that. That's the, as a last slide. This is really where we're going on this is how, how good are we at predicting? Can you use it somewhere else? Can you generalize? Bigger studies, we feel much more comfortable with large American studies because they have a, that's why MESA, for instance, is multi-ethnic. The thought is the coronary calcium findings would be able to be generalized. Uh, cost, for instance, the newer markers like an uh, imaging marker for asymptomatic people, such as in MESA, that's a critical evaluation. It's slightly different from the biomarkers. Uh, there, there are newer methods coming along. Um, so Mike, Mike, Michael Pensina developed the reclassification method. Um, uh, I reached him yesterday afternoon to ask him something, and I said, well, what about, the question came up at a meeting here, is what about reclassification in case control design? He said, that paper is under review. <laughs> he has just submitted it. <laughs> so, and uh, so the, the, the field in the newer methods for how to, how to improve on what we're doing. Um, one of the things that keeps coming up for certain types of testing is radiation exposure, for instance. Um, that is especially an issue for asymptomatic individuals. And then the other thing is people say, well, who's really going to use risk scores? Health, uh, public health officials have always been using them. The people probably uh, the first used risk scores, can anybody guess? Insurance companies. Insurance companies have probably been using them for about 30 or 40 years. Uh, and the more expensive your insurance, uh, the more likely they are to use it. Uh, they're concerned, they, they pay out at death, uh, but the, the, the risk scores predict death extremely well. Um, the, where's the next generation for greater penetration? It's probably the electronic medical record, number one, and paying uh, health providers to control risk either to control the individual factors or to control the scores. And you say, well, I'm not sure that's happening. That's already starting to happen in the VA. Uh, we can tell how well the doctors are taking care of uh, all the factors and estimating risk as well. So thanks very much. So, yes. Is it on? This one on. Yes, yeah. this one is on. Thank you very much. I noticed you, you stayed away from vascular disease and stroke, uh, even though Framingham at this point says use the same um, algorithm to estimate right. risk for stroke. And you didn't even have either vascular disease or stroke on your risk equivalent. So do you want to say something about well, vascular right. disease? So the, the, the debate right now uh, for American guidelines is first events. And first events are um, the, the most important risk factor for a stroke, in fact, is a prior coronary event. Uh, and so if you had a coronary event and you predict uh, stroke, you get a very different thing if you exclude people who have uh, never had a coronary event. And I've done that. The, that. That is, in fact, what the guidelines are moving toward is total cardiovascular disease as first events, as first events, uh, which is slightly different. And, the, and the, the variables that are different, one is having had a heart attack, or especially. The other one is atrial fibrillation, is a critical driver of who's going to get a stroke. Um, others are... Mitral valve calcification, for instance, that's a critical factor. Uh, are, but are events heart failure now also? That is, um, I, that debate's not uh, even been undertaken yet. I, I think uh, there, uh, the Framingham paper that is right now is the guide post for, by Ralph D'Agostino for the next round of uh, guidelines, includes heart failure. Uh, but what most of the other non-Framingham groups would say, and even if you go to CHS and ERIC, they do not have good heart failure data. Uh, they have not adjudicated it uh, the same way that Framingham. Framingham has a really rigorous process for heart failure and has a key paper. Pat McKee's paper, who was a Duke cardiologist, believe it, many years ago, and, uh, wrote a key paper when he was a fellow for what are those findings. Those other studies are not, the guidelines are probably going to be based on what's in ERIC and Framingham and CHS to drive these prediction equations. 
and there's going to be some element of a pushback because they don't have good heart failure. So my guess is it's going to be total heart, what I would call hard CBD, and it's going to be MI, CHD death, and stroke, or, and stroke death. But those are great. You're, you're, you're right on the money for what are going to be the critical outcomes for the future. And first events, first events. Mm -hmm. yeah, MACE is starting to do heart failure, and that the markers are totally different. Which is yes, uh, you know. So and how do you lump all that together? Now you're talking about pretty, pretty um, heterogeneous disease. Well, that's why you got to be careful. For instance, so the number one and two cause, the sort of neck and neck for who's going to get heart failure in the modern era, are diabetes and hypertension. And that's not what I learned when I was in training. I said, Where, where's a heart attack? Well, now that's three or four. That's three, and then valvular disease is four, a very distant four. So it's, it, you, don't, you get heart failure without having had a heart attack. So then you say it's diabetes and it's hypertension. And then you're going to start getting, all right, uh, heart failure in diabetic, obese diabetics, I want my BMPs. And yes, so it's a slightly different markers, and it's going to be more adipokines, I would guess. And, and it's not, certainly it's not going to be lipids quite the same way. For instance, heart failure is not a big term. Lipids don't drive who gets failure. Same way lipids don't drive. If your first event is a stroke, lipids are not a big driver of that. So it's, it, in some, you do better to keep some separation rather than lumping everything. But there, we're in a move towards lumping, I think. Not easy. Other questions? I'll ask the imaging question. Why do we need to draw blood at all? Why don't we just take a picture of the arteries and see what's going on? Um, very interesting, you know. So if you looked at carefully at the MESA paper, uh, if you look at their, what, what the imaging does, where you sort of wondered where did the imaging help in the original approach? And what it really did is it, it, really, it really aid into age. It tells you truly your age. And if you add imaging, we, so we already had, uh, yeah, a poor so man's imaging is I knew your age, uh, and I knew you were a male or a female. So, but you could you could take that apart. All right, but now you have an abnormal score. Okay, let's say you have a CAC of a 300, a good healthy number. And now I'm going to say, okay, Doc Douglas, here, uh, I've got a CAC of 300. I'm in clinic this afternoon. What are you going to treat? <laughs> and you're going to still have to go do all those other things. And those other things are, cost about ten dollars. And until you get coronary calcium down to $10, it's, it's not going to be cost effective at all. LVH, for instance, was looked at carefully. LVH is not at all cost effective uh, with a 3 to 5% hit. As you start to identify population groups where you're, getting a, you're going to get a yield from CAC, CAC is going to for sure be worth doing. It's a question, for instance, would you... Would you, if you were paying for the MESA study with the thousands of people who, 6,000 who got the scans, or would you, I would have thought if I were to do the study tomorrow, to identify with regular risk, find the intermediate risk, and then just scan those intermediate people. Can I go back to that slide? Is there an easy way? Maybe I need the fellow to help. Here, yeah, here we go. It's well, I mean, obviously, the interme intermediate risk people are the ones that are likely to get reclassified up or down. It's, it's kind of hard otherwise. So it's, it's, it's in this. Now, this is the problem why you don't scan immediately, is these folks. So they're not getting cases, and you have 60% in MESA, and, and especially if this is even higher in fraction if they're women. Uh, so you want to probably go into this group in here, in this intermediate group, and scan there. And I, I think uh, that's what most of us are tending to say to patients who have the ability to get scans. They're, they're not covered by insurance. Uh, most middle class people are saying, hey, if, if you've not had a scan, it's reasonable to get a scan. Uh, the other aspect is most scans are got radiation. Uh, and now there's some concern with your scan assignment is only good for five years. So what do you, does that mean every five years you're going to get another imaging? And hopefully we'll have that resolved with some 
better guidelines for what that imaging would be. Maybe it'll be an MRI. It'll be some, some non-ionizing radiation every five years. But I agree with you. But I think the point is you, you need both. Because if you have an abnormal you know, skin... really getting expensive. If, you know, but if you have an <laughs> abnormal skin, should I focus on my blood pressure or my lipids? And, it's, and, what, and what is my goal? And those are pretty cheap. They're very cheap, in fact, uh, if you do it. And uh, everybody gets a chem profile almost every year who has insurance nowadays. It's pretty cheap. So. Eric, I would like to say one thing. Yeah. Risk is, is, a, is a game that, inter, that epidemiologists care about. This is, isn't about risk. It's about treating patients. And the degree to which you've mentioned in this talk, one time the concept of therapeutic uh, threshold changed. I said, uh, yeah. Well, I agree they're changing. Because, yeah. I mean, yeah. what does it matter if I know somebody's risk if, if I'm not changing that? Or what does it matter if I classify, net reclassify somebody from an arbitrary line yeah. on one classification group to another yeah. if it doesn't change some therapeutic threshold that I do? So is this test any value? I can't tell you. The, 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 the do coronary calcium? I absolutely can't tell you. Because all you've shown there is that you made three artificial class. If you'd have made five, you would have had a different score. Yeah, he has a, he has a way to assess that. No. would have made a different score. No, but I, I didn't write this, per Eric, as you know. No, I know. I, I, I was the editor of this paper. So, but I, I, can, I, 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 I can defend what they did. The best done in the field, but it doesn't address the question of what is the therapeutic threshold to do something different, either on the patient's perspective or the physician. No, but Eric, to, to counter a little bit what you said, is... The point is, you wouldn't now do this. You wouldn't be doing an imaging for people in the lowest quantile of risk that you're interested in. Unless we get paid. Unless you could what? Unless we get paid. <laughs> well, I'm not sure. You know, but the point is, if I can, I'd, you know. It's a different kind of outcome. <laughs> you know, for instance, uh, I, and people ask me, well, can I give you an analogy for, for testing in the hospital setting? I say, yes. And I can give it, the best one is a tuberculin test. I can't see patients without a tuberculin. I'm, I'm negative so far. If, I, if my status changes, something else is going to happen. I'll go into a different algorithm. But the point is, it's like giving everybody a chest x-rays and or more advanced testing, which is what we used to do, you know, when I was in, you know, way back then. We, so that, that was the, and, and Paul Ridker found the same thing for CRP here, is that we should be using something at an intermediate risk and, and I think we can get there reasonably effectively. And then I, I agree with you. I, you know, I think you know, we want to then also, you could take the other point is the people at very low risk, should we be hitting them, the 35-year-old woman with a negative scan and with normal values, should we be treating her super aggressively with all, for all of her risk factors? She's unlikely for the next 20 years to have an event. If you take that same numbers, and you give it to a 65-year-old woman, we have some clinicians who are treating perhaps them equally. She should probably be emphasizing more the 65-year-old woman. She's much higher risk. So. Well, I mean, I think part of what Eric's getting at is that that Framingham lowers category is uh, at, there's a lot of reclassification that comes out of that. And so for individual patients, because Framingham is so skewed for age and uh, and for 10-year incidents that if you're under the age of 65 and female, it's pretty hard to be in a high-risk category. It's almost impossible. Well, you know. So is there well, some other, but obviously you still have this lifetime 30% chance of dying of coronary disease. No, but what's going to happen, what I think is going to happen uh, is, first of all, is that our idea of risk keeps getting lower each time. And for each risk factor we've done that, we start systolic pressure or hypertension, we keep lowering. For instance, um, we, well, you know, we now have these very healthy targets, so we're going to have the same sort of thing for, we're going to probably, intermediate risk is going to be somewhat lower than it was at the previous iteration. It's likely. And now they're going to, the rules are going to change because it's going to be total cardiovascular disease. But it's going, to, it's going to include more people. More people are going to get treated, and it's going to, and the idea of low risk is going to become progressively lower, so. Carrie, you wanted to say something. You have the last word. Okay. Great talk, uh, Peter. Thank you. I, I just wanted to emphasize that all of the concepts of uh, discrimination and calibration and so on, uh, classification accuracy that you've discussed are uh, 
are important. It's also important to remember that in assessing the underlying relationships between um, new measures of risk, biomarkers, uh, uh, the results of imaging studies, whatever it might be, that uh, th these, these risk assessments are typically done using modeling approaches that make certain assumptions. And one can, uh, you know, if, if you violate those assumptions or if you don't carefully check those assumptions, whether you've got a linear relationship or a nonlinear relationship, et cetera, you, you can alter the classification accuracy, the discriminatory ability, et cetera. So one has to, uh, to do this modeling very carefully and make sure you understand the nature of the shape of the relationship with the outcome of interest. And um, uh, oftentimes people are, are taking inherently continuous measures and dichotomizing them or cutting them up into several categories, in which case you, you tend to lose some information. So all of those sort of um, uh, issues have to do with the careful modeling of these relationships which ultimately influence your assessment of risk and your classification accuracy. Yeah, well, I, I agree entirely with what you're saying. The, the other, one other simple point related to that is almost all these models where they have continuous measures are developed with continuous measures. And the categorical is something later to perhaps uh, improve utility or the awareness or perhaps as a teaching tool. Uh, but related to the variables themselves, for instance, almost all where there have been continuous measures, they've also now started to move to using logarithmic, me log-derived measures of those variables too. Um, that's a, absolutely required for things like imaging where you have these logarithmic uh, factors. But more and more, the British group's doing it. Ralph's model that was in the Framingham group from a couple of years ago also took the log of all the variables and then used those. And, and the other thing is, once you have a model, it doesn't really mean much until, if you want to say you have a prediction tool, until you've shown that it can work somewhere else. Uh, until then, you, you have an individual report. So I agree. Thank you all very much, and thank you very much, Peter. We look forward to working with you on Promise.